You are listening to Society Stand. You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take. On March 12th, the feast of St. Gregory the Great. When you hear his name, you know there's bound to follow a list of extraordinary feats, don't you? Most of us know that we owe the great music of the church, Gregorian chant, to his influence. A doctor of the church, he left us with writings documenting the truths of our faith, stretching back to the very first centuries of Catholicism. He was a great missionary pope, converting huge swaths of the known world. You can't get much more influential than that. But about this title, The Great, not whether St. Gregory deserves it, because of course he does, but do you wonder like I did about the title itself? What makes for the distinction, considering there are so many saints we might also think of as great, who don't get the title as part of their legacy? Is it an official title conferred by the church? How many greats are there? And do they come from all different strata of church life, or all they or are they all big wigs in the hierarchy? I looked it up, and here's what I found. Though it seems there is a list of popes at the Vatican, the Annuario Pontificio, that does distinguish the greats among the successors of St. Peter, the Church never officially pronounces saints as, quote, quote, great. Rather, those whom we know by the title have won the honor by popular acclaim at the time of death, and later earned them in perpetuity by the acknowledgement of history itself. When the moniker, sometimes applied out of the affection of a saint's contemporary society, stands the test of time and the objectivity of distance and comparison, the saint is officially, unofficially, one of the greats. There are seven holy men and women of the church who have thus stood the test of time and are acclaimed the greats of the Roman Catholic calendar. Though there may be more, these are the most universally recognized. Three popes, Pope St. Leo I, who reigned from 440 to 461 AD, Pope St. Gregory I, who reigned from 590 to 604 AD, and Pope St. Nicholas I, from 858 to 867 AD. There were two bishops, St. Albert the Great, also known as Albert Magnus, um, who lived about 1200 to 1280 AD, and St. Basil the Great, also known as Basil of Caesarea, who lived from 330 to 379 AD. There was one abbot, St. Anthony the Great, also known as Antony of the Desert, who lived from 251 to 356 AD. And last but not least, one abbess, St. Gertrude the Great, also known as St. Gertrude of Helfta, who lived from 1256 to 1302 AD. St. Gertrude exemplifies one motive for using the title great. In a couple instances, the addition simply helps provide distinction between two people of the same name. St. Gertrude, the only woman called great, received the title from Pope Benedict XIV to distinguish her from Abbess Gertrude of Hackborn, who was the elder sister of St. Mechtild, an abbess of St. Gertrude the Great's convent. Gertrude of Hackborn, though renowned in her time, left no writings and is not a canonized saint. A good abbess and a holy woman, but the abbess didn't merit the distinctive acknowledgement from the Pope that St. Gertrude the Great did. St. Anthony the Great had a similar problem. Perhaps more commonly known as Anthony of the Desert, he earned several distinguishing titles chiefly to prevent his being confused with St. Anthony of Padua. You'll hear him referenced as Anthony the Abbot, Anthony of Egypt, Anthony the Hermit, and Anthony of Thebes, but the title of great is a well-earned asterisk, considering he is known as the father of all monks, one of the founders of Christian monasticism. Today's saint, though, 100% merited the title great. Pope St. Gregory was born in Rome in 540 AD to a wealthy Roman family that was also devoutly Catholic. His great-great-grandfather had been Pope Felix III. His mother, Sylvia, and two of his aunts, Tarsilla and Emiliana, are honored as saints. A civic ruler first, Pope St. Gregory served as prefect of Rome before entering the religious life, the Benedictines, at 33 years of age. He was chosen to be a papal deacon by Pope Pelagius II in 578, 
was papal nuncio to the Byzantine court from 579 to 585, and finally was elected and consecrated pope by unanimous decision in 590 AD. His pontificate was distinguished throughout with greatness. In his Liber Regulae Pastoralis, he detailed the specific duties of bishops. He recorded many lives of the saints in his dialogues and reformed clerical discipline, removing many corrupt bishops and priests from office. He was responsible for peace treaties among barbarian invaders, converting many, and commissioned several groups of missionaries, notably to the British Isles through St. Augustine of Canterbury, St. Columban, who converted much of France, and St. Leander, who freed Spain from the Aryan era of the Visigoths. He protected the Jews from persecution and ransomed Christians captured by barbarians. He administered a proper accounting system for the church, enabling the church to pay these ransoms and to feed those suffering from famine, in addition to civil projects such as the repair of the crumbling aqueducts. St. Gregory, at the death of his predecessor Pelagius, ended in what may be considered a miraculous way the terrible plague in Rome and advocated the value of bathing as a necessity for bodily health. Perhaps most famously, he instituted the Gregorian chant, and to him is attributed the practice of offering 30 masses for the repose of the soul after death. He is one of the 29 doctors of the church and is considered the final Western church father. And this just hits the highlights. We can only conclude that Pope St. Gregory is not just great, but one of the greatest of the greats in the history of the church and the world. But he was the first pope to refer to himself as the servant of the servants of God. That's St. Gregory for you, great even in humility. Which brings us back to the concept of greatness. Seeing as all saints in their own ways are by definition great, the question has to be, what was it that made St. Gregory and the rest of these seven universally acknowledged greats? Popes, bishops, abbot and abbess, how did they stand out in this greatness? Here's what I think. What all saints have in common, but especially the greats, is this, that they were, as G.K. Chesterton liked to call, antidotes, not just of their particular time, but of all future times in the history of the church. They offered what souls needed in their own age, sometimes even cracking the whip on the church itself when it needed to be pulled back on track. And then from the beauty of the Gregorian chant to the devotion of the Sacred Heart, to the examples of the guardianship of the church and the founding of ascetic and communal monasticism, every one of the saints called great made permanent contributions to the individual souls of their time and also to civilization in general. They were a gift to our ancestors and to us. My prayer is that we live to see the next great, and that he or she will be the antidote to the problems of our crazy times, but most especially that they'll lead wandering individual hearts, one by one, back to God. St. Gregory the Great, please intercede for us. This is Lisa, signing off.